This episode is brought to you by Morty, Buzzshot, Cogs by Clockwork Dog, Recon, and Patreon supporters like you. Cogs by Clockwork Dog is an easy-to-use software-hardware platform for running interactive events, including escape rooms and other immersive experiences. Their plug-and-play hardware seamlessly integrates with their software, so you can create a show with lighting and sound cues without having to write a single line of code. Map all kinds of inputs to outputs by building up simple logic steps, which determine what you want to happen and when. If you're new to immersive tech, COGS can empower you to create without writing any code at all. Using simple building blocks, you can create any kind of puzzle in the software, and their system will tell the hardware exactly what to do. And if you're a seasoned maker, they have an abundance of tools to expand your capabilities. Create any form of logic by using their expression language, build your own plugins for external software or hardware, and create your own custom content for things like physical or touchscreen interactions. Get the COGS starter set for only $130 plus free shipping to the USA. This bundle is usually valued at $257. You can learn more and purchase your starter set at COGS.show. Use code REPOD at checkout. That's R-E-P-O-D. Link and details in the show notes. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need a getaway from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. This season, we are shining a spotlight on Southern California in celebration of our convention, Recon, which will be in Universal City, California, on August 18th and 19th, 2024. Tickets are on sale now at realityescapecon.com. And today's guest is artist and experience designer, Brett Jackson. He has created and contributed to countless immersive experiences, but he is best known as the founder and president for life of Imagine Ne'er Do Wells, the kooky concept club for creators of experiences. Welcome to the venerable Brett Jackson. Hello, friends. Good to see you. Good to be here. Self-appointed president for life. (laughs) Self-appointed. All of my honorariums are self-appointed. It's so much faster. Love that for you. I am so excited to have you on to talk about Imaginaire Duels, which you run once a month here in Los Angeles. And you will be running for all attendees of Recon Los Angeles this summer. I think it's absolutely a blast. And I could not stop raving about it to David, who went and he fell in love with it. She would not shut up for many (laughs) seasons about how wonderful Imagine Ne'er Do Wells was. And I had no idea what she was talking about. (laughs) It is very hard to explain. And it's something Uh that you really have to experience in person. I see on your website, you call it a creativity social club, which is accurate, but it doesn't really encapsulate how fun it is. So how do you explain this madness that you have created? Oh, geez. Like a lot of creators, I'm more interested in making things that I've never seen before. So I end up having a lot of things that sort of occupy this blind spot of the mashup. It's a little bit like this mixed up with this. So if it's hard to explain, that's my fault. But uh, the general idea here is that the players are brought in and they're given an outlandish request from a fictional client. And then they get 15 short minutes to invent an original attraction concept of any kind that satisfies three bizarre requirements. And then we pitch those concepts and then we laugh at those pitches. And kind of the fun thing about it is that you can't do it wrong. All submissions are voluntary. You only share if you want to. All submissions are anonymous. If you don't want to pitch your idea, you don't have to. And the expectation is that all submissions will be terrible. So for a thing that has extremely high pressure in normal situations, like coming up with an idea on the spot and then pitching it to a room full of people, we have put nothing but safety wheels. And so uh, you can walk away from this idea the second you feel shy, but the encouragement of the group and all of the safety features put into it make it so that almost 95% of people pitch their things and walk away feeling like heroes when they do. Yeah, I love that it's very much a networking event also, but 
that's the other great thing is that, you know, it meets once a month and we have time to get to know each other because the judging aspect, when you guys are judging the submissions, we have about like 20 minutes to grab a drink, interact with your fellow attendees. And so it's really nice that you have a short break from the creation aspect and you get to meet with everybody and discuss what you guys have made. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we also have intermission games so that you have an excuse to go up to people, an excuse to talk to them. That's something that obviously was like a foundational principle of what I wanted to build. I wanted to make a networking type thing for creatives. I'm very involved in the Theme Entertainment Association and I'm on their events committee. I love the TEA. But a lot of times these kind of things end up being handing people a business card, asking for permission, assessing what your status is next to the person you're standing to. Everybody crowding around the one person who has the hiring responsibilities. And those are all kind of terrible ways to feel. And so wouldn't it be much nicer if you didn't know what a person's company was, if you didn't know if they could offer you a job or not, and the way that you met them was based on the strength of their ideas. And they would come up to you because they were excited about something you had made, and that would be what you were talking about. And only later do you find out that they're an executive producer at Disney. Isn't that a much more compassionate way for creatives to interact with each other and find out who it is in this room they want to work with and who they want to be friends with? So that's what I craved. And I'm glad that that's something that feels like a primary appeal of it to you. It translates so incredibly well. I have said before on the show, I'm not a big fan of icebreakers and I'm not a big fan of networking games because I find that they're usually deeply cheesy and contrived. I love this. Can you walk us through a typical gathering of Imagine Narity Wells? Sure. Okay. So you come in and you will be introduced. There'll be an introduction where you are met at the door by some steward of the game who gives you a custom name card with a secret little glyph on it that you won't know anything about or even recognize until later. And they give you your player card. Everybody gets this beautiful player card that's like beautiful cardstock, beautifully typeset, two sides. It looks like a really quality, cool little artifact of something that sort of resembles graph paper. It sort of resembles like a playing board, but you don't know what it is. And you're given your name tag. The first rule is that you're not allowed to fill in your own name. You have to make a new friend here to fill out your name tag for you. So that's the first kind of conceit is you're like, Okay, normally I might just get a drink and sit down and wait for something to happen, look at my phone. But in fact, you're not permitted to do this. You have the smallest excuse to walk up to anybody that you find interesting or the person that you sit next to and say, I wouldn't normally do this. I'm a cool, shy person like all of us. But this game is making me ask somebody else to fill out my name tag. Will you please do that for me? And so it gives the player the smallest permission to have the smallest interaction. And if that interaction turns out to be pleasant, that's an interaction that you continue for the rest of the night. Out of curiosity, what are your expectations for the name tag? Are you expecting people to go and say, hi, my name is David, and then you go and write David on the name tag? Or yeah. are you expecting me to like, hi, and then you do look at me and you decide, that dude is Tim. Okay, this is why we play test, because this was an emergent property of the game that I had never suspected before, but which kept coming up, which is that people were having other people fill out their name tag. And they were giving them just like a title or a made up name that they thought that they looked like. And that was completely unexpected. I'm not always the person who meets you at the door. Sometimes it's some other steward of the game. And there's signage there on the table. And on the back of that signage, this laminated placard is the script that they're reading where I have dialed in the language. So if I read the script appropriately now, you would not really have that misunderstanding. But honestly, if that happens, that's a delightful surprise. That's now a shared anecdote that you have with a rando. And that's kind of a sweet little bonus. It was a mistake when it happened that later I tried to hew it a little bit closer to the cow path. But when it does happen, I'm always glad to see it. And both parties get the biggest kick out of having a secret name for each other. To be honest, I see both as successful. I, I don't yeah. think that one is inherently better than the other. I do think that having someone give you a new name is more interesting. Oh, yeah. Or like in my case... The guy that I asked to fill out my name tag was like, I want to guess your name. And I was like, you're 100 percent not going to guess how my name is spelled, but we can play Wordle for it. And we did a little oh, game. I was like, there's so three perfect. E's in it. Yeah. And oh. it ended up being really fun. And this is what happens when everyone there is naturally a creative and they're there and they're primed and they're ready to play games anyway. Oh, that's so nice. What a great idea. But one thing I want to stress you don't have to think of yourself as a creative to enjoy and be a part of this. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm actually thinking about maybe trying to like loosen the strictures a little bit, try to do a little bit of a rebranding so that it makes it clear that it's an opportunity for creative play. But many of us creatives have some level of imposter syndrome where we don't feel like we have the bona fides to be at, at some of these tables. And that's almost always wrong. I'm thinking, is there a way for me to present this? So if you just like creative games, if that's the kind of thing that is fun for you, this is your kind of room without saying that it's necessarily for immersive creators, even though that's who I made it for. That's what I am myself. And, and that's the sort of people I want to stock the pond with. Well, maybe we can uh, brainstorm that in the bonus episode. Love it. Let's do that. Patrons, you can join. Yes, please. Let's continue with the walkthrough of the Imagine Ne'er Do Wells evening. We've got our name tags. I've been given a name. Maybe I'm David. Maybe I am something else. Okay. All right. You have a few minutes to get the drink. Uh, at some point in the evening, the venerable celebrity guest will arrive. And that's another attribute of the game is that for each meeting, we have some cool creator that we think that folks will want to meet and we invite them to be the sort of de facto judge of the game. And then also this is an opportunity to celebrate that person. That's also like a fun little trademark of this because a lot of times our favorite creators are kind of anonymous in their day-to-day -day life. But if any of us met the person who made X, Y, or Z, we would be going bananas because we're such a fan of their work and we like this about it or that about it. It's a nice little enticement to, to reach out to some creator whose stuff you really like and say, you don't have to do anything. You just show up and be yourself. And we're going to make this experience so cool. You're going to look like such a hero and everybody is going to celebrate you. This is an opportunity for a bunch of people who are your fans to celebrate you. And that is true. I, I really feel that we position it in that way. And the people who come first as venerable celebrity judges often end up coming back just as members. And then also it's just, it's cool to meet your heroes. So the first thing we do is the game is played in a pretty regimented way because we're able to play it with 20 people in the room or we're able to play it with 100 people in the room. And so for something that requires somebody standing up on stage and people to all do a creative thing, those are both sort of amorphous, open-ended things. And so if you want the game to feel fair to 20 people and also feel fair to 100 people, you really have to keep the segments of the game highly time-boxed so that you get to the meat of it and then give all the available time to the people to do their work. Once the game begins, we introduce the master of merriment, who is sort of a comedian that sits next to the venerable celebrity judge. We introduce the venerable celebrity judge with glowing praise. I list their bona fides. I list the thing that they want to promote. And then I spend a lot of time thinking about what is so cool about the work that they make. And oftentimes that's a beat of sincerity because I look like a schmuck up there, right? Like I'm a complete cornball. But like, I just wing this like dart of real thoughtful sincerity about what I like about this creator right over the plate. And you can see them go, oh, I didn't know that this would be that. I really feel now like this is a group of people that see me as I want to be seen. And then that sort of starts the love fest for that creator, right? From that moment on, the weirdos is one way that we frequently refer to our members, have open season to compliment this judge and celebrate them. And indeed, people are always throwing comments to the judge. What does the judge think about this? It always goes to them first for the response. And one of our rules is that you are able to respond to pitches with two things only. You're able to say things that you like about it, and you're able to ask questions verging on flirtation. From the jump, it's nothing but positive feedback. And that's another thing that creates the sort of bubble of safety around what is otherwise a ticklish creative challenge. The fact that questions have to be phrased so positively is an important part of it because it removes this very common thing that for anyone who's ever had to pitch creatively. Yeah, yeah. The hand grenade of a question that someone on the client side is asking because they want to destroy you. Yes. It doesn't feel like an interrogation. Right. Yeah. You know, when somebody is just like, this is a really interesting idea. Tell me again, what do you think the budget is for the project? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not a question that is meant to get any information out of you. It is a question signaling to the room that the person asking it feels that the pitch is unacceptable. Yeah. Well, the pitches are completely ludicrous anyway. <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> right. That is true. But also, I mean, you've both seen it like every couple pitches they're all good, right? They all have something that is meritous in them. But every couple pitches, 
everybody takes a beat and like you feel it come over the room where everybody is recognizing that's a really good idea. That is something I would actually do. And we never want for those. In some sense, the worse it is, the better it is, frees you up. You're like, I don't have to do anything here. And then your idea, your good idea is the one that gets you the most excited. So these concepts of the worse the idea is, the better it is, and all submissions are terrible. It's talking to people whose egos are tied very closely to their work and to the ideas they come up with. This is a really interesting concept because it is really underscoring the notion that the first version of any idea, even a good idea, the first version of it is not going to be the complete picture. It's not going to be great. Yeah. And everybody is in the room spitballing here. So it's not like there's refined practical concepts emerging. Yeah. I think it also really helps with intimidation factor as well. I've met a lot of people that attended that were like, I'm not that creative of a person or I can't draw or I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what to do. And then they eventually realize it's not that serious. We're just here Mm -hmm. to have fun. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. One of the things that we say is every amazing creation ever made started out lousy. And that's a true statement. Art is process. It's not magic. Like all of these ideas start out crude and half formed and It takes an artist working with them through iterations to make them into your favorite song or your favorite board game. And that's just a true statement. So it doesn't matter if the idea is clunky. Your favorite piece of art started out clunky. And this is just in the same stage as that. We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing escape rooms, haunts, and other immersive social outings. And Morty is now available for all to use on its fantastic website experience, iPhone app, and its new Android app, available in the Google Play Store now. I believe in Morty so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. One of my favorite ways to use Morty besides tracking my escape rooms is discovering new escape rooms. Now, there's obviously amazing review sites like Room Escape Artist, but Morty is really great for finding rooms local to an area. Morty is really great for searching in an area and comparing all of the local escape rooms. You can sift through all of the different reviews. They have a smart review system that shows you the most relevant ones. And I especially love this feature when I'm traveling. I use it a lot for planning out my escape room trips. And I think this is the best tool when you're planning out your next escape room vacation. You can learn more at morty.app slash repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners. Link and details in the show notes. Can we get back to the walkthrough? Because I wanted to ask you about some examples of the types of prompts that you will ask for. Sure. Okay, so we explain the rules of the game and then everybody learns the prompt at the same time. I explain the rules and it's this woolly, bizarre thing. And you're taking on a lot of information over the course of 30 seconds all at once. And then I always say, are there any questions? Great, no questions. And that just short circuits people's brains because of course they have questions, but that's telling them, you know what? You don't need answers. You're going to be fine. And then I show a slide that has the prompt and then the three requirements for it. And the art in a good prompt, I feel, is that you want to take something that is fecund soil, a topic that people are really interested in that has like a lot of good experiences associated with it, something that you could feasibly be hired to make a good attraction about. And then you take something that is contradictory and then jam those things together so that the task is then to reconcile things that don't go together. There's versions of it that like are are various takes on the mashup, but like that ends up with things like, okay, you're going to make a new experience and your prompt is Las Vegas, but with a mandatory bedtime. You're going to make a zoo, but it's going to be open concept. No cages, no bars. I remember that No cages, no walls. That was the one that I went to. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, cool. 
For the TEA meets one we did with the uh, the Wild Optimists, who, again, I'm sure fans of the show know and love, we did one called No Single Riders, which is Attractions for Dating Singles. Oh. And then we give three requirements, and they're generally in this format right here. An experience that is safe for singles to meet and mingle. Again, we try to keep everything generally safe and happy and pleasant. Never mean, never cruel, never bullying. That's something that we just don't have in our club. Two, an experience that is effective at making connections. Again, this is a legitimate creative constraint. You've got an attraction for singles, and you actually want people to be able to meet and mingle. So this is not just a complete goof off. When you hear an attraction that satisfies these two requirements, all of a sudden, this is a good idea, no matter how silly it is. No matter what it looks like, it does fit the viability criteria. And then three is always cleverly named with theme-appropriate wordplay. And so the three is like, what are you going to name this attraction? People then have 15 minutes. We have a timer on the screen that's countdown. We ask that it be completely silent. A lot of people like working in silence. I also like working in silence. We have lo-fi chill music playing on a loop in the background, pretty low. And we have a countdown timer in the lower part of the screen. And then the prompt remains on screen. So you can refer to it at all points throughout the 15 minutes. And everybody has 15 minutes and they, they fill out their player cards. And then at the end of it, we say, time is up, Sharpie's down. And then we all repeat the club serenity mantra, which is that perfection is the enemy of progress. And now we say, okay, creative fellowship is why we are here. And so we're going to take 30 minutes to judge this. And in the meantime, there's an intermission game that has to do with some secret thing on your name tag. Our classic one is that each name tag has a tiny little glyph on it. It's either a churro, a corn dog, or a turkey leg. And I always like the joke, yes, the original Holy Trinity. Sometimes people laugh at that and sometimes it just skates right by, but it always makes me laugh. And the idea is that you have to find somebody in each of the three types and you have to ask them what they made. And as we say here, don't worry about people stealing your ideas because if it's in any way original, you're going to have to ram it down their throats. And then you go and you get a drink. You walk up to somebody and you're like, oh, corn dog, uh, what did you make? And you have an excuse to talk to them. You can seek out the people you would have wanted to talk to already, or you can just go to the bathroom or be on your phone or anything else. It's not mandatory, but you do have a very light flavor of objectives if you actually do want to talk to people. What I really love about this sort of mini game is that you as a participant in Imagine Ne'er Do Wells end up spending the better part of a half an hour hearing other people's ideas, but also pitching your own and practicing pitching your own. Mm. Yes, exactly. It's sort of like telling a story. The first time you tell a story, it's going to be too long. It's going to have too many asides. It's going to have jokes that don't land. It's going to not feel like a whole. But if you tell that story two or three more times, it will become more concise. The punchlines will land. Your timing will be better. You'll realize the details that don't matter and you'll cut them. All of that stuff gets much better. And so over the course of that half hour, you are low-key practicing for what comes next if you get selected. Yeah. And you're also getting to hear other people's ideas. And that takes a lot of the pressure off because we always have the expectation that somebody else's ideas are going to be gold and ours are trash compared to that. And that's just more of the imposter syndrome that we as creatives suffer from. And so when you get to hear a lot of different ideas, you go like, I might have a chance here. These are all kind of zany ideas. Oh, oh, mine's yeah, pretty good. And then people hear your idea and they react to it very favorably. And that also gives you confidence. And while everybody else is getting a drink, the host, the venerable celebrity judge and the master of merriment are all sitting up on the dais at a table. And each of the three of us gets one of the three requirements. And we give it a numerical value from one to five based on how well they achieved that one specific requirement. And each judge only does one requirement. So they're going through all the entries consistently looking for this one thing. And so they're really in that headspace. They're really able to calibrate whether the thing that they're seeing now is better or worse than the one they just saw. And that's kind of a goofball thing, right? You're assigning a number value to a completely creative concept, but there is some scoring integrity to that, right? As long as the same judge scores the same criteria consistently all throughout, if one judge grades harder and another one grades easier, that doesn't matter. 
because that will out in the totaling of the three things, the three numbers. So while people are out getting their drinks, there's another countdown timer on screen, and the back of the player card has the sort of judge's rubric, so each judge can know what they're scoring and give it a number value. And then they hand it to me, and I tally it up, and then I take the top 10 scoring entries, and I enter them into the presentation so that it works this way. I'm very impressed that you're able to get all the entries in the presentation within that half an hour, too. That's a lot of like taking the photo and uploading and everything. Yeah, well, it's it's pretty systematized. It didn't start this smooth, but now we know how we can scale it so that it's fast and fair. And fairness is pretty important because even though you're like, ah, I'll try my thing and I'm going to I may not even stand up. Everybody kind of wants to win. And whether or not you want to win, if the game ever feels unfair, people check out like that. The system has to have integrity or there is no game worth playing. If you scale this for, say, from 30 people to 100, do you just make the judging time longer? Because that's a lot more entries to get through. Do you employ another judge? How does that work? Great question. When we have done that, we add another bank of judges. Just three more judges can accommodate the same throughput in the same time span. So the judges are all prepped ahead of time. It's possible to take the judges right from the audience, in which case you sort of deputize them before the show. You let them know what it's going to be. They get the same rubric card that the judges do. And when they come up, they sit down. They are scoring a random selection of different people's cards and not their own, never their own. And for every 50 players, you add another bank of judges. And that keeps it so that the approximate time is the same. But even if it's fudged by five minutes because of logistics, that's the time of the meeting where people are networking. They're getting to talk to other people that they want to talk to. And they have the additional pressure release of knowing that they're not going to get stuck in a conversation that they don't want to be in. Because at a certain point, a buzzer is going to be ring and this is going to be over. If you're a creative introvert, as many of us are, then it's very safe because you know this isn't going to last forever. You're not going to get stuck. If it's not fun, you don't have to do it anymore. This is just a thing you're doing for now. But honestly, it's always great and you always enjoy it and you always wish it would go on longer. And that's the perfect point to cut a phase. When people are like, oh, I could have done five more minutes. That's when you want to cut a phase. I agree with that. Buzzshot is escape room software powering business growth, player marketing, and improving the customer experience. They offer an assortment of pre- and post-game features, including robust waiver management, branded team photos, and streamlined review management for Yelp, TripAdvisor, Google Reviews, and Morty. Buzzshot now also has integration with our other Repod sponsors, Morty and Cogs. I feel incredibly lucky that I truly love all of our sponsors this season. And you know, one of my favorite things is that Buzzshot integrates so well with Morty and Cogs. So imagine this, the team fills out the Buzzshot waiver. They're automatically sent a link to review the game on Morty. At the same time, the player's names or maybe their team name can be automatically pulled and inserted into the game by the COGS integrations to add that personalized touch. You can address them by name. I think the possibilities are endless. Be creative with it. Streamline your marketing and grow your escape room business. Repod listeners get an extended free trial and 20% off your first three months with no setup fees or hidden charges. Visit buzzshot.com slash repod, that's R-E-P-O-D, to learn more. Link and details in the show notes. I'm curious, because I'm going to have to recruit quite a few judges for Recon Los Angeles. What do you think makes a fantastic Imaginary Do Wells judge? Mm. Uh, Honestly, the true answer to that is anybody who has played once before. I honestly think that the game indoctrinates people very effectively into the culture of the club and the game, which are one and the same. And very frequently people come and they play and then they come in and they may be icy or tentative. But at the end of the game, they're like, now I get it. I'm coming back. I'm going to win next time. Once you play it once, it's internalized. And at that point, you are a viable judge. 
I'll tell you this much too. The second time I went, I had sat down at a table with a bunch of people that I'd never been before. And I was like, I'm going to give you some tips for how to play this because <laughs> I've been once before. And two of the people that I gave tips to, both of them ended up winning. Oh. Yeah, I'll share those. Yeah. I will share those tips in the bonus episode. Bonus episode. <laughs> huh. All right. So so submissions are in. We have been judged. We have been summarily judged. And now it's time for presentations. Correct. So people come back and I say, you have outdone yourselves. Our judges have surfaced 10 winners. If your concept was not selected, that's because it was too good and we have kept it for ourselves. Here's what happens now. First, we reveal a winning concept by its working title. We just say the working title. If you are feeling brave, stand up and you get two minutes exactly to pitch it. And then everyone here tells you only what they love about your concept and polite questions verging on flirtation. If your title is called and you do not wish to pitch, simply remain anonymous. We will pitch the anonymous concepts and we will enjoy your flirtation. And so that's how we set it off. We announced the title and there's a buzz through the audience because the titles are a scored category. So the titles are usually pretty good. And so you hear a title and there's a round of titters and somebody in the audience gets the electric thrill of knowing that is their attraction. And then they have a moment to decide whether they want to stand up or not. And uh, we encourage people to be brave and make new friends. And so we say the winner number 10 in no particular order is called this. If the creator cares to pitch, please stand and take the stage while everyone here claps. And there's a minute where you don't know what's going to happen. And then somebody stands and they take the stage. And when they take the stage, I say, please introduce yourself, stranger. And the screen shifts from the working title to a photograph of their player card with a two minute countdown timer on it and the working title again. I hand them back their player card if they wish to use it as like a, a note taking page. Some people want it. Some people don't want it. And then they get two minutes, two minutes exactly to pitch this thing. And as they're getting close, there's like a little like Legend of Zelda chime at 10 seconds. There's a chime at one second. And then it does a little lilting piccolo thing that says, okay, your time is up. And then we ask the judges and we ask the audience, what do you love about this? And then everybody is so excited to say what they love about it. The judges get to go first. The judges usually have some delightful insight. They just get the mic. They can talk for as long as they want. The important part to make sure that the show doesn't creep in its length is that the pitches are exactly two minutes. And so in a room of 20 people, if there's 10 winners... You're like, I got a chance of winning this thing. But even in a room of 100 people, if you know there's 10 winners, you still feel like you have a chance of winning that thing. So it's important that there be 10 winners. And also then there's a nice big fatty cut of people that we deemed excellent. And as long as you keep them all to two minutes, that means that that segment of the show is exactly 20 to 25 minutes long. And the show will never be longer than the duration that we have the given room for. People are complimentary as hell. They love it. And when the player finishes, we hand them a certificate of excellence that has the date of the show and the theme on it, as well as our very special, one-of-a-kind Medal of Creative Excellence. But we do something that I think is really, really cool and makes me laugh a lot. It's a, a dumb little thing, but it's a squashed penny. It's an elongated coin that has a colored rim in it. It's like it's got a pin on it so that you can pin it to your jacket and the club attire is any purple blazer. So many people are dressed in matching goofy outfits, which also just makes me laugh. It's just a dumb thing that I love. And so you win a squashed penny with a colored ribbon dangling from it. That is the corresponding color of month. So that when you have a blazer that is festooned with them, it will have the signifying months that you won your game. And I also plan it months in advance so that the ribbon colors vary. So it'll be like they're across from each other on the color wheel so that if you go for six months, you'll have a nice spray of alternating colors. And that's the game. We do it nine more times. And then we do a thing called best possible experience, which is decided by vote. If you could only go to one of the attractions described tonight, which is the one that you would choose? And we read all of the answers again. I have everybody close their eyes and then... By show of hands, I get the best possible experience. And then we announce that. We thank our judges once again. And then we hang out and party together until the cops come. 
And that's Imaginary to Wells. Big fan. As soon as we went, I was like, this is a thing we have to have at Recon. The reaction for me came from a mixture of, this is very much an immersive experience in a very different shape than what we're used to. Thanks. But it is also this creative exercise and this networking opportunity and all of those things come together to create this very warm, very silly environment, which I love so much. And we're always talking on this show about the need for more whimsy and for more play in these immersive experiences that we love so much. And I feel like this encapsulates so much of that in such a different form factor. And that's something that I immediately felt called to share with our audience and why we wanted to also have you on the show to kind of help people understand what this thing is. Uh, That is so lovely to hear. Thank you so much. I'm showering you in praise right now, the venerable Brett Jackson. (laughs) I'm soaking it up. A daisy in the sunlight. Thank you, David. You're, You're quite welcome. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, and just an observation, is that folks who aren't from Southern California or Orlando don't always get the name Imagine Ne'er Do Wells. At the risk of asking you to explain a joke and ruining it, can you break down that name for us? Oh, yeah. Oh, this name is my problem, child. Are you familiar with the creative bromide Murder Your Darlings? Yes, I am. Okay, that exists so that you don't get too fixated on one specific bit that then you start to make bad choices about the rest of the creative work to keep one thing that, for reasons of merit, should not be allowed to persist. And that is what I am doing here. I have made a selfish, terrible mistake because this portmanteau, I loved it so much that I just decided, I decided that was going to be it. It had the potential for like a legal repercussion with Disney. I was a little bit scared of that, even though Imagineer is not invented by Disney. It's in the public domain. And I knew that it was a portmanteau that didn't necessarily read good to the ear if you didn't know what it was. And then it was combining a word that feels like it's owned by the biggest media company in the world with an antiquated word that half of the world doesn't know. Uh, And that's 'er ne'er-do-wells, which is like (laughs) baddie, like a no good Nick. I relate to this word very much. (laughs) That's an old (laughs) word. And so I'm like, imagine 'er ne'er-do-wells. And the original idea started when I was trying to come up with, uh, you know how Disneyland has their street gangs? The folks that wear their jackets there? No. What? Oh, yeah. We're talking about this in the bonus episode also. (laughs) Okay. Well, I wanted to make one of those and I'm like, what's the best name? Because I love naming. I take a lot of pride in my naming. It's uh, something that I consider to be one of my few superpowers. But this name made me laugh so much and it didn't have to change the spelling of Imagineer and it did the nicest sort of positioning of this thing that's associated with creative experience design and then suggested that it's like the bad guy version of that, but not too bad. It's like what your grandma would call bad. So the inflection and the meaning all worked well and it was so beautiful spelled out and it was wrong for a thousand reasons and I did it anyway. I just loved it too much and so I made a terrible vain creative mistake. It happens to us all. I feel like I'm about to go to the gallows for this. And now I've at least said my piece. In some ways, the story that you're telling feels perfect for the ridiculous structure of Imaginary Wells. All ideas are terrible. And it fits in its own weird way. And it is a super clever portmanteau of Imagineer and Near Do Well. It is a wonderfully crafted portmanteau if you get it. To its own disservice. Yes. Right? And it's like, cleverer than thou, which is not like our attitude at all. But yeah, I just, I loved it and I put it there anyway. And I'm sorry, everyone. I mean, I think it really encapsulates the brand of your type of humor. And you said the prompts and the title, all of them are about the odd juxtaposition of a familiar concept with something that's a little bit off. It's a little bit weird. And that's where the humor and the play really comes in, I think. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the the juxtaposition of two things that have contrasting elements is like one of the key dynamics of comedy and all of the things that I make are comic in tone. Creativity, comedy, and play are all that I make. Those are very central aspects of it. That's also like how you produce pleasant discovery and pleasant surprise 
which are both experiences that you want people to have time and time again in an experience that you design. That dynamic is definitely one that I'm constantly trying to sniff out. Okay. We have dissected Imagine Ne'er Do Wells, but you've done so many other things. And I, I want to dig more into you in the process and talk a little bit about some of your other work. One of my observations of you is that you have this kind of rebellious streak to you. You do a lot of mixing unusual ideas with traditional concepts. What kinds of things inspire you? Oh, I can be a little bit of a formalistic wonk, right? (laughs) If I see somebody who has made a board game that uses some concept that's like the observation of a unique concept, well executed, just in the abstract, is something that I love to nerd out on. So that's one thing. I would say like my other North Star is we create things with an audience in mind, right? We have a notion that something would make us laugh or would make us cry. And then we also have our sort of pantheon of friends and loved ones where we know their senses of humor and we know their intellect and their story sensibility so well that we're making jokes to make them laugh or making things that I know would pique their curiosity, an irresistible sounding premise for this person or that person. And so I feel like I'm very lucky to have a lot of delightful, brilliant, cool, creative friends. I oftentimes steer things that I know that very tasteful coterie of weirdos would find really interesting or funny. That's something that I think that is a substantial motivator in the work that I create. Adds up to me. That's how I design my audio games for the podcast. Will this make David laugh? (laughs) Oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, that's one of the best gifts of having like a really close creative collaborator, right? Is it like you're making it for an audience of one and you trust that person's taste? I have just one other question about where you're coming from here, which is, I don't think it's a stretch to say that a lot of creations in the immersive space, especially on the theatrical side and also on the high end of escape rooms, can be a bit dour and serious. You seem to come at just about everything from a place of joy and humor. Where is that coming from? Well, I think that's just who I am. Like, I love to laugh. I love to be surprised. I love to think about things and explore concepts. And I have very limited appetite for self-serious work, for overly well-trod ground. I feel like I could name the top 10 war horses of our industry and you would both go, oh, I've been to a few of those. And I I don't want to do that because I I don't want to disparage anybody else's work Mm -hmm. because sloppy work can have greatness in it. And I'm not gunning for anybody, but I just don't, I don't like that myself. Yeah, no, I I understand. And I'm definitely not asking you to call out specific work. And I love serious work as well, but I do think that the balance of serious to whimsical has been askew for a long time. Yeah. And I love seeing people explore within the, it has its own confines, but the confines of humor. Thank you. I love it too. And whenever I see somebody in the space who's also doing ha-ha stuff, I always rush to that person and I want to make friends right away. Like uh, Jeff and Andy Crocker and Mr. Mischief, like the geniuses over at Hatch Escapes, Wild Optimist. Those are my people. And so whenever I meet someone who's doing funny work, then I'm always very excited to talk to them, collaborate with them, and generally make them my friends. So let's talk about some of your other work. You've also created Blackbird Pie, an immersive experience centered around fine dining in a fantasy tavern D&D style, which I had tickets to attend and it was literally canceled the day before I could go because of quarantine. So can you explain what this is and how it worked? I see what this is. This is you orchestrating a confrontation because you never got to redeem your tickets for Blackbird Pie. This interview is over. (laughs) Let me in. Let me in. No, that's true. Oh, my God, PJ, I forgot about that. I had forgotten about that. I mean, we've talked about it since and in the past. And like, I definitely owe you that and we'll make good on it. But yeah, I had had forgotten about that. Okay, so uh, Blackbird Five was the five course immersive gaming experience of fine dining in a fantasy tavern. I really love embodied sensory experiences. And so food and drinks is something that I often go back to in my works because food very greatly ingratiates you to your audience. It makes community. It's a way to caretake 
for an audience on many levels that they don't fully understand. I also love to host and cook for my friends. So I keep coming back to this, but this one was a little bit different. It actually started because my beloved niece, Phoebe, for their 16th birthday, wanted me to host a D&D game for them and their friends. I'm like, definitely. And then they say, they're like, and it's going to be probably like 11 or 12 of us. I'm like, hmm. That's a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. So then I took it back to like foundational principles here and and said, what is Phoebe asking for? What is the experience they want to have with their friends? They want to have a sword and sorcery, slash them up, adventure, and they want to see goblins. Things got to be cool. They got to be talking. And they and so I'm like, okay, let's stick to things that they think are great about D&D and do things that you can do well with a group of 12 people that have never played D&D. And what I came up with was the very earliest form of Blackbird Pie. For Phoebe, it was Zang Cow Chicken, but they came in and it was flagons at the table and chicken and you would eat with your hands. And everybody came in costume, which I was so gratified for. And so you come in and everything on the table is diegetic to the world of the game. There are no elements. There are no foods served. The labels on things refer to things in the kingdom where you are at. And so that was like even the very, very first version of that was like, At this table, you are in this world. And then there's two events that come in quick succession in the first five minutes of the game that I cannot spoil for you here. They are the game. They are the thing which makes people say, do I get to keep this? Do I get to stay here? We get to do this the whole time? And it was such a gratifying response that I'm like, no, this could be a commercial product. I could do this. And I wish I could share it with you. And I will do it for you, PG. Like, we'll figure this out. But there's things that happen early on the game that entrain the play engine, the game cycle that people go through, which involves telling a story together to pull off a heist in this world, the map for which is the tablecloth that you're sitting at, and you have a certain amount of time to do a very important thing or something very, very bad will happen. And while you're talking about it, I serve you a five-course dinner with meal pairings. And once I created the official ticketed version, you know, it wasn't just Zank out chicken. I was able to work with a chef who created a, this is a Jonathan Gold hyped chef to create a five course menu that all of the foods and their wine pairings date from a culinary tradition from the sixth century BC. You're at this lavishly themed communal king's table bacchanal eating these rich historical foods that feel like they would be homemade at a king's table. And then you're drinking wine and that's great. And there's a very heavy toasting mechanic. Like the call and response is one of the things that I replaced like a lot of the traditional initiative check stuff for. Mm -hmm. And so you're eating and you're drinking and you're talking with your friends and nobody has the dice too long. Nobody's ever waiting too long until they themselves are playing despite the large group size. And then by the end of it, you've had an amazing meal And you've got 11 really great new friends. That's Blackbird Pie. And yeah, we got reviewed by No Proscenium. It was a pretty favorable review. And like everybody was really excited about it. I'd done a few of them now. So I'm like, okay, I got this thing on rails. Like it was getting better and better. And then COVID. Then the idea of a bunch of strangers sitting around a table in a confined room, no matter how beautifully themed, with like actual blacksmith carpenter nails in the walls, like just a crazy level of like WTF just seemed terrible. Like eating with your hands, like breathing in other people's faces. It was just a straight no-go. So I had to let the room go and I had to close it down. And it hasn't come back yet, even though we could probably do that now. And indeed, like maybe that's a next thing between client work and originals that had more profit potential. I haven't gone back to Blackbird Pie and clearly I have some work to do. Sounds great. So we are going to go back in time a little bit You may be the only guest we've had on the show who's studied game design academically. Mm. You earned a master's of fine arts in design and technology with a focus on game design from Parsons. Is there one lesson you took away from your academic experience in game design that you wish more people in the space understood? Fail fast, iterate and prototype, and muck it up before you muck it up. You just got to build the crappiest version of it and get in front of people fast. That's the fastest way to get the most solid thing most effectively. And that's not a thing that you can only go to a very expensive and long program to learn. 
but that's a very important lesson. It's a lesson that I don't think enough people have learned. I think people spend a lot of money to realize that they still have to iterate in this space. Yeah. I mean, the greater message is don't get a graduate degree. Just start building the things that you want to build and you're going to figure it out. When you go in as an acolyte, you don't even know the questions you need to ask. And they're going to tell you things that aren't going to make sense to you because you don't have the context yourself. Just start building. Don't wait for anyone to give you permission. Just start building the version you can build today with the resources that you have and get it in front of people and then just keep doing that. That is the lesson of grad school is don't go to grad school. Just make it. As someone with a graduate degree as well, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. And then by the time you meet the master, you won't be sitting at him going like, okay, what's the 101 situation? You're going to know exactly what you want to ask them. How did you do this? Why did you make this decision? I noticed this. Why did you do that? And, you know, that's also going to be a much richer conversation with the master because the master wants to talk about that. They don't want to talk about the 101. David and I have been going through the back catalog because we are about to export a lot of them onto YouTube. And so I was going back through season one where we talked to Alon Lee. And one of the notable things he said that stood out to me was that he really wants his games not to be entertaining in and of themselves, but to make the players become more entertaining. Oh. And that just really stuck in my head. And I feel that way about a lot of your work. Mm. You know, it feels like your work is really centered around creating opportunity for the players themselves to express their creativity and for them to make games and for them to be funny. What is the secret sauce to encouraging that type of interaction? That's uh, certainly a favorable comparison that I'm very grateful for. When I'm telling people what I do, depending on what the audience is, like I'll say game design, I'm a game designer, but I really think of it as experience design. Even when you're a game designer, what you're creating is the experience of them playing a game. And indeed, most of these experiences use gamification because that's a great way to motivate people without bullying them. But absolutely, yeah, you want to create the system by which the player can have a really cool experience or a really intimate experience or a, a really healing experience or a, just a good belly laugh. And it works about like you would expect, I would say. You never want to tell somebody what they have to do. You tell them what they get to do. Everybody gets to proceed at their own pace. Everything is opt-in. Nothing is required. Know that they're going to hate everything in the first two minutes and they're going to think this is all BS and you're really going to have to prove yourself to them. And that's why you need to get to that first act break as quickly as you can. Don't give them a chance to form a negative impression. Come in strong, get them playing, make them carry the load, because when they're doing that, their critical apparatus is somewhat disabled as they start to, to do the thing. And by the time they have done the thing, they will be converts. I feel like you just described in reverse all of the problems with escape room onboarding. <laughs> oh, please do tell. Escape room onboarding is generally about all of the things that you aren't allowed to do. Hmm, yeah. Oh, that drives me nuts. Yeah, it is frequently dull and gives you ample opportunities to form negative opinions. Yeah, tell me a lot of negative things that I'm not allowed to do in a space that I haven't seen yet. So there's not really even a contextual way for me to know that. Okay, good. And also, like, you're kind of killing my buzz right now. Like, why are you scolding me before I go into this thing? Oh, yeah. It's always fun to be scolded for the things that other people might have done in the past. <laughs> right. Yeah. While perusing your website for your consultancy, Live Action Attractions, I noticed your rogues gallery of client logos, which has a lot of the usual suspects who hire creators in the immersive space, Disney, Netflix, among others. But I noticed a curious logo that I have a lot of history with, the United Nations. Can you tell us what kind of work you were doing for them? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this was a campaign that was very near and dear to my heart. But this was for the uh, Paris Climate Summit. The UN was sponsoring a piece of branded content that had an environmental bent to it. And the creative brief that came to me was how can we communicate how people can contribute to ending climate change without bullying them, without overloading them with information. And so I created a piece of media called One Thing, which was a short, funny 30 second spot that was effectively like 
reducing all of the learnings about climate change and the way that we as people move through the world into one instruction for what you could do. I have to ask you, what was that instruction? There were two versions of it, and I'm going to tell you the one the client didn't take, and that was called Sneaky Vegan. The premise was that, like, actually, if you just reduced your red meat consumption, that would be more effective than you even giving up your car. Nobody wants to be a lame vegan. So here's how you can be a sneaky vegan. And so it was all these people who uh, who adopted vegan habits fractionally in their lives by lying to their loved ones and those around them. And that is the better advice for the takeaway for your listeners. And I think the much funnier spot. But it was deemed unacceptable for this application. That sounds like the correct choice for the U.N., but. Really good pitch. Thank you. Brett, what is the best way for people to follow you and your work or to connect with you? Absolutely. You can always find me on Instagram at Live Action Attractions. You can go to liveactionattractions.com. And then, of course, once a month, you can find me here in L.A. at Imaginaire to Wells, the uh, Kooky Concepts Club for Immersive Creators, which is at the impossible to spell domain name, imaginairedowells.com. No spaces, no dashes, no apostrophes. It's imagineerdowells.com. You can find that link in the show notes. That's what you want. I've said this a couple times over the course of this episode, but I, I admired your work as soon as I started experiencing it. And I am so excited to be able to share what you do with our audience here and at Recon. I hope that if you're listening right now, you got your ticket to Recon LA. We're going to be doing Imagine Narity Wells. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of other incredible things. This is going to be such a wonderful way to help show people, in addition to telling them, how to do great things in this space. Mm, it's a world-class compliment. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you too and everything that you do and uh, love your work so much. So it's just an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. The Reality Escape Pod is produced by Teresa Piazza with support by Lisa Spira and Tommy Haunton. We're edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media, music by Ryan Elder, logo by Janine Proct, and all of this is brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. If we haven't made it clear enough this season, the Reality Escape Convention, Recon, is happening August 18th and 19th, 2024. And if you buy your tickets before May 1st, you will get special benefits in the form of priority session selection for Imagine Ne'er Do Wells and the 49 boxes. Do it now, get your tickets. We'd also really appreciate it and hope to see you at Recon. You can learn more at realityescapecon.com. Details in the show notes. Believe it or not, we are 10 years into Room Escape Artist, and it took a long time for us to decide that we were going to go and open up a Patreon, but we eventually got there because some loyal readers at the time were really insistent. Over the years, we have added a lot of different things to that Patreon. People at the $5 level get access to the bonus show for this podcast. Folks at the $15 level get the incredible Spoilers Club. But more than anything, they get to support all of the things that we're doing here. And that, I, it's hard to tell you just how much that means to PG and I, to the entire team at Room Escape Artist. We put in so much time, so much love, and so much energy into everything that we are doing here to support the escape room and immersive gaming communities, to push them to be safer and more fun, to be smarter and more efficient, to try and pull new players in. We're working on all of these things all the time. And the money and support that we get from our Patreon community is the fuel that keeps all of that moving forward. If you're a part of that, thank you so much. And if you have been considering becoming a part of it, give it a shot. We really, truly will appreciate it. Thanks. You can learn more about all of this at patreon.com slash roomescapeartist. Big thank you to our highest level Patreon supporters, Karen, Donward, Panic Room, 
Escapism, Olivier Escape, Escaparium, Byron Delmonico, Breakout Games, Keystone Escape Games, Derek Tam, Paula Swan, and Rex Miller. Thank you for your ongoing support. And thank you to all of our patrons at all levels. You've made it to the end of this podcast. You must be an amazing, resilient, and very loyal person. If you're still feeling that delightful afterglow, why don't you head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you review your podcasts and leave us a five-star review. It really means a lot and it helps us to spread the word. I have contributed substantially to two proper escape rooms, and that's Space Squad of 2-Bit Circus, where I largely did scripting, and the other one I did concept design for. And so the creative brief was essentially this. 2-Bit Circus says, we want to make the game of operation, but everyone we know hates hospitals, they hate needles, they hate blood. So can you give us some concepts that find the fun, some conceptual fun to hang this on that avoids all of these terrible things and so we can have our game of operation. And so this is what became Dr. Botcher's Minute Medical, which turned out so good. Those guys are absolute wizards of fun. I, I love to play it. I love to, to see it, which I pitched to them as 20 minute medical school. And so I, I thought you might enjoy hearing a uh, discarded alternate concept. So I took to them, knowing the, the creative limitations here, clown surgeon, save this clown's life or die laughing. A team of visiting surgeons are thrust into a high stakes surgery in progress to save a circus clown from an assortment of clown related maladies. And there was just a pall over the room. And they're like, Brett, the only thing that people hate more than needles is clowns. <laughs> This is a nightmare box. Why would anyone go pay to go into this box? This is terrible. 